Hi there. I thought that uh, perhaps this week we could do something on magnetic media. And this one's probably going to be a bit of a long one. So what I'm going to try and throw at you is kind of like a table of contents first. So you can figure out um, where you want to skip to the video if you just want to see what I've got and aren't so interested in how these things work. So I thought I'd begin with a very rough overview of magnetic media. A bit of a glossary, some history, and then what I've got, and finally how all of this crap actually works. So, in the beginning, was not this. There was this. The very first magnetic recorder was on wire. And, okay, this is actually from Cat 6, but work with me here. Back in the 1890s, a Dane by the name of Paulson figured out that you could record magnetic impulses to a piece of wire. And so he had a spool at one end and a spool at the other, and it was wound from one to the other. The only problem with that was that at the time there were no amplifiers. So when you recorded the sound onto the wire and then played it back, it was actually quite a lot quieter. Uh, and in the early 1900s they figured out how to do amplifiers, and that made this much more useful. Now, after this came tape, and the first tape like this came around in 1928 by a German by the name of Flumer, and he figured out that if he took iron, um, iron oxide, he could melt it to a paper tape, or rather he could bond it to paper tape and wind it on. And that was much, much more useful than the wire because it was flexible and it was thinner. And this had a real nasty tendency to break. While these were used for analog recording of sound, of voice, they weren't actually used for digital until somewhat later. The first tape mechanism used to record um, digital data was used in the Univac in 51. And it didn't actually look like mylar tape like this. It actually was more like a bandsaw. It was a half-inch ribbon of very thin steel that wound on and off spools, very much unlike this. Uh, in fact, they didn't go back to this until somewhat later. Funny how these things work. Now, after tape, we got discs. Tape is handy because it stores quite a bit of data and it's fairly flexible. Discs, however, were much, much faster. The very first disc was a IBM, it was called the Ramac 350. And it had 24, I'm sorry, it had 50 24-inch platters. And we're going to take a quick detour here to describe the uh, basics of a magnetic disc. We have our spindle, which the media rotates on, and we have our platters. In this case, this is a two-platter drive. We have our surfaces. We have an upper and a lower surface of the first platter and an upper and lower surface of the second platter. You could read and write to both of these surfaces. And the uh, Ramac, which was from 1956, so way long ago, um, carried 3.75 megs. It was 5 feet deep, six feet high, two feet wide, and was a little over a ton in weight. Now after the Ramac, where you had fixed platters, where the uh, read-write heads would interface with the platters, there came removable pack drives. And this allowed you to, as the name suggests, put the disc into the drive, read off it, and then remove it again. So now you could carry the data with you. Now obviously they carried less data than a fixed, because of course you could have more platters in a fixed device, but 
um, that was not as important as the flexibility of moving it around. And not to mention, when the fixed devices came around, the first one made by IBM in 1962, they were uh, increasing in density. The first in 62, the 1311, had six 14-inch platters and 10 pounds apiece carried two megs. So we went from 2,000 pounds to 10 pounds and damn near as much disk space. Now, uh, oh, it also should be pointed out that while this device carried two megs, and that was the equivalent of 25,000 punch cards, but only a fifth of one of these at the time. So they still had the edge on data storage, but because the... Um, Platters could be spun at a much higher speed. The um, data could be read off much, much faster. And because it was running uh, underneath the heads, the data access times was much, much lower as well. So with a tape, you would have to spool halfway through the tape to get to the data you were looking for. This, you just had to wait for the platter to come back around underneath the read head and pick it off there. Now, after pack drives and the uh, continual march of technology and improvements, we got floppy disks. This is an 8-inch floppy, uh, and it's made by 3M, who were actually one of the first manufacturers of floppy disks. A chap by the name of Shugart, who worked for IBM, came up with the 8-inch floppy disk. And the System 360s, they needed a way to do the microcode load when the system booted, and in the earlier models, they used all sorts of crazy mechanisms, one of which was a paper um, ribbon, like a, a um, never-ending ribbon, which was sucked onto a reed head using vacuum power, and the um, microcode was loaded from the paper tape. This was much more reliable. The 8-inch drive was also quite a bit smaller than the um, tape readers or even the hard disks of the time. This is a real Shugart. Shugart left IBM to make his own drives. After the 8-inch drive, or rather after the 8-inch disc, Shugart came up with the 5 and a quarter. And this made its first appearance in around 1960, uh, sorry, 1976, 1977, somewhere around there. Uh, and it first carried 110K. Now the floppy disc between the late 70s when it showed up and 84 steadily increased both in the quality of the media and the quality of the read-write heads, but also in the varying encoding formats that were used. Finally ending with the 1.2 meg floppy in 1984. Now, we had the Micro Floppy Industry Committee, and I'm not making that up, who in oh, roughly 1983 decided they needed something better. The three and a half inch floppy debuted in 1986, starting at 360k, and by the end of its lifespan, could do up to 2.88 megs. Now, around the time when we were going from five and a quarter to three and a half, there was a format explosion. You had all sorts of helpful people coming up with their own formats and their own designs of discs, everybody vying to come up with the next piece of equipment. So you had the three inch disc, not three and a half, three inch, 2.8 inch, you had the godforsaken Apple Twiggy file wear, which had two reed notches on either end of the disc and the label sat sideways. You had the Maxell CF2D, you had Nintendo's Famicom disc, which looked kind of like this, but wasn't. All sorts of stuff like that. Thankfully, we ended up with something that was vaguely standard, and not too much of a crutch. Now, diskettes were massive 
obviously, in the 80s going into the 90s. But we're soon out of favour with the ease of getting CD writers. And then, of course, Flash and NVRAM, which culminated in the USB stick, making these completely irrelevant. So, let's move on to what I have. And the first thing that I'd like to show you, I can't actually put on the table, so we're going to go down that way. This is an IBM 62 PC from the late 70s, and this particular drive comes from my IBM System 34, uh, and I have parts of this that I'm going to show you in a bit from a slightly earlier drive. Now this unit has a big plastic dust cover, and you can see that there are six 14 inch, I'm sorry, six 12 inch platters there. We have our spindle motor, vibration dampeners, the logic control section is in here with a fan to cool it, the belt for the spindle drive, and then the reed head mechanism which is here. From around the same time I have this removable pack drive. Now this goes to my CDC 9762. This particular media is made by CDC themselves, however all sorts of different companies made the media including say Nashua. I've already taken this one kind of apart, but the way that they usually worked is you would take the pack and you would place it in your drive. Uh, oh, after uh, removing the base plate, place it in the drive. That would release the cover. You'd remove the cover, close the drive, and it would spin up. The heads would engage and off it would go. Now, this, uh, this drive is five 14 inch platters. only three of which were actually used. The um, upper and lower surfaces were not used. I think they were for protecting the middle ones, but I'm not positive. The 14-inch platters have a total of 80 megs between them, and they didn't actually use all six surfaces. They used the upper and lower, upper and lower, and then the upper of these three platters and then the lower of this platter here was actually used for servo tracking uh, and it was fixed signals uh, written into the media which would tell the drive which had a massive head that would slide out and engage where it was on the drive and we'll get to those technical things in a minute. Let me pop this back on. There we go. Now going to jump ahead a heap by moving to the Seagate ST51 and then this monster here and I'm not actually sure what this brand is but the ST251 I do know about because they made these in huge numbers and these were 40 meg drives they rocked your data off at 5 meg a second and were MFM formatted and there are three five and a quarter inch platters inside this the full height drives usually had five to eight platters, uh, and this one is SCSI. Now, we're going to jump from this to removable media. Oh, I've lost my drive itself. The LS120. Now, this is a floppy disk, but if I can figure it open the damn case slightly different. This is in fact a floptical and floptical is worked by using a infrared LED to more precisely align the read write heads on the disk media. So it's in this case a slightly higher grade magnetic media but it's still basically the same thing as a 1.4 meg 3.5 inch floppy but with the optical it was able to pack 120 megs onto these things and then later 240 megs. The cool thing about the LS120 drives, and I do have one but it's in a PC and I forgot to pull it out, is that it can also read regular 1.4 meg floppy disks so you could use them for both. They also were IDE rather than floppy bus which meant they were a hell of a lot quicker which when you remove 120 megs would be really really handy. I also have Zip, 
with the zip drive. Now, I never actually owned one of these back in the day. And I'll show you what I had in a second, but the zip drive, again, if I can get it out of the damn case, was basically, and it's almost impossible to see in there, and I'm afraid I don't have enough discs, so I'm not going to take this apart, a floppy disk as well. It has a slightly more rugged um, disk media, magnetic media. And the heads fly above the media rather than touching it like a regular floppy disk. And it used a voice coil read head mechanism, very much like a hard disk rather than the simpler floppy disk. They started with 100 meg, they went from this to 250 meg, and then 750 meg before they were finally dropped. I looked down my nose at these things. The click of death problem, what a joke. And they really went very fast. Now I had an easy drive. Now this is a 135 meg disc cartridge, removable. And behind this little window, who I have totally forgotten how to expose, there is a hard disk platter, basically. And it used a three and a half inch form factor drive. It was also ideal that you could get them in parallel and SCSI. They would be internal or external. Um, this is my second one. My first one, when I had taken the computer apart one day I managed to get a little bit of something on the um, PCB and it shorted and blew. I was very very sad because removal 135 megs in the days when hard disks were only 540 megs was massive. It was one of the best gifts my father ever gave me. Now as well as these styles PC hard disk we also had a bunch of funny formats We've got our more standard three and a half inch third height drive. But we also had oddities like this. And this is a quantum Bigfoot. And the idea was is that you would stack two of these in a five and a quarter inch internal drive bay. Uh, it has a single five and a quarter inch platter, and this was a 1.2 gig drive. Now this one is shot, but I keep it mostly because it's kind of weird. And then, of course, we went on to these little suckers, the two and a half inch drive. In my case, this one's shot. These are everywhere now, and it blows my mind that you can pack 700, 800 gigs, terabytes, onto a drive this big. One, maybe two platters at most. Just incredible. I thought we'd start the technical portion of our show by having a look at... A five and a quarter inch drive, which I have, as uh, I said before, already partially dismantled. Now, uh, removed from the drive is the uh, drive head motor, which sits about here. That's where these wires go to. But we have faceplate, the uh, drive lever mechanism, the upper mechanical mount, the lower mount. This is the read ride head itself. It runs on a linear slide here. We have the drive light indicator, the activity indicator. This also has a infrared LED which picks up whether the right protect notch is covered. And then here we have the index hole pickup. On the underside of the drive we have the drive motor itself, which is actually a stepper motor, and then the controller board for the stepper motor here. At the back we have a little PCB, which if I slide the reed head forward, you'll see it has a little yoke here. And this has another um, infrared pickup, which is used to determine when the reed head is in its far back position. So if we pop a floppy disk in it, I'll pop the face off, there's my cat again, I'm going to hold the read right head mechanism down because uh, with the drive motor removed it kind of floats. back and then by turning the mechanism here 
this engages the upper and the lower spindle so now if I turn the drive motor in the back you'll see that if it did have the disc media in here the disc media would now spin allowing the read write heads full access. Now with the motor missing it's kind of hard to get an idea of how it works but the read write heads will slide back and forth on this linear rail that's back here sorry back here and uh, allow the heads full access to the diskette media. Well, with this removed you can see that here is our hole which shows where the sector hole is. We'll get to that in a bit. And so the uh, pickup which is in this tiny little wee slot here will shine through. Now uh, if I pop this out uh, actually, tell you what, let's have a look at the big one. That's like uh, blowing it up. So this is our 8 inch drive here. We've got the upper spindle motor mount. This is our, I think this is a disc present indicator here. You'll see this wonderful big worm screw here. This is for the read-write head mechanism which is this unit here. Now this is a single-sided drive. So unlike this, where you've got a reed head on the top and then there's another reed head on the bottom, this only reads one surface of the diskette and so it has a reed head on the underside. And so this rather large motor in the back here, I think if we turn it, you'll see the reed right heads. Slot back and forth. We have the voice coil magnets, the voice coil itself, the head mechanism, the spindle, the platters, and then the controller board. And this is the bottom of the spindle motor here. And this, in this case, is an ECA SCSI. When the drive's powered down, and there's going to be some scratching because this has gotten a head crash, ooh, the heads would move back into their home position. And this drive is a three platter drive. I'm going to look close at the platters. This was an old IDE disc, I believe, which I've taken apart. But it still has a spindle motor, and you can see the two platters there. Here we have the drive with the platters pulled. We've still got our spindle motor, our pickup, the logic board's removed, we've got our read and write heads, the voice coil. And the voice coil, as we've shown before, lived between a pair of very heavy duty magnets. There's one on the top and one on the bottom and the coil itself slots in between. And there's my cap. Now, I could pry these things apart for you, but I already pinched my finger once. Well, that was last week, it's mostly healed. Usually I pull these things apart and I stick them to the fridge to hold things on the fridge that I don't want my children to remove. The way the magnetic field sits on the drive magnets, when the coil itself is energized, it will flip it back and forth between fully engaged on the platters and then to the home position. You can see that this was for a two platter drive. We have two sets of reed head armatures and if I pry these apart you can see the reed head mechanisms, kind of. Now this is a two platter drive, that's kind of cool, but I can do better. This is a 106 gig, bleh, 160 gig SCSI drive. It's already been partially dismantled. It's already been partially broken. And this has a really hard to see six platters. These came DOA. They were a great disappointment. Now, we're talking about hard disk head mechanisms. This is the head itself removed. This is from a single platter drive. 
and we have an upper and lower reed head. I've got our voice coil. Now this is kind of hard to see, and I was trying to figure out how I could make my camera pick this up better, because I have a flip, and it's not too bad, but it's not great for macro stuff. And then I remembered that I have this. This unit has an integrated voice coil and magnet on the Reed Reed unit itself. So we have the voice coil here and the magnets up and down. Now that drive had six platters. This one only had three. And you can see we have three head pickups here. These are the platters from the drive itself, rather badly scratched. And this is just a fairly basic iron oxide applied to a, I think it's a steel core. The newer hard disks have cobalt, and that beautiful reflective finish applied to a steel core. The read ride heads in hard disks actually float above the surface. They use what's called the Bernoulli principle, which is related to the way that a fluid, in this case air, flows around a spinning object. When the hard drive platter spins at a high rate of speed, and most of these spin at 5400 RPM, but the newer ones are 7200 or, and by newer I mean late 90s and up, uh, and then of course you can get 15k or 15,000 RPM drives. The spinning motion creates a boundary layer of air, and it's only a few nanometers thick. And the hard disk reed heads actually fly on this boundary layer, so it stops a head crash. As an aside, the platters these days are wonderfully pretty things with a mirror finish. Once a year, a bunch of my friends and I get together, and we have the GTG, or the get-together, and we do a silly thing called Geeks with Guns, and, uh, well, I'll let you figure out why. I thought I would also show you a silly trick. Now remember, we've called this a voice coil? Well, that's exactly what it is, and uh, what I've done is soldered a couple of leads to the underside of the voice coil Ends. And if I sit this here, let's see if we can stand her up. Come on, there we go. Now if I turn on the radio, you should be able to hear it. Now it's going to be kind of soft and I have no idea what's playing. Here's hoping uh, YouTube doesn't pick up any real audio and cut my video, but... I didn't say it was a good speaker, but it does work, doesn't it? The anatomy of a floppy diskette has, uh, for a five and a quarter, the dust jacket, then the diskette itself, which comprises the outer jacket, and then the media. Let's slice this one open. So the outer jacket obviously has space for the labels. It has right protect notches. In this case, it's got two for a flippy disk. Um, later diskette drives that were double-sided didn't need these. These are for the uh, earlier drives that were only single-sided, like that 8-inch diskette drive over there. We have the index hole and then the read-write hole itself. The media, as I said, was iron oxide bonded to a mylar disk. We have a reinforced inner ring here, which the upper and lower spindle mounts clamp onto to turn the disk. And then the index hole itself, which denotes the first or zeroth sector. We'll get to that later. The three and a half inch diskette is pretty much the same thing, but just in a slightly different form factor. We have a sliding metal cover here, this way making the uh, outer dust jacket unnecessary. I've popped the spring off this so I can remove it easily. Okay, not that easily. Then we have the uh, physical diskette itself. We've got the spindle and the indexing point is clamped into here, or 
stamped into here, I'm sorry. If we take the disc gate apart, you'll note that this has a cloth inner surface. The uh, five and a quarter also has as well. Now this cloth actually cleans the disc gate as it rotates inside the drive. So this is when things get a little more complicated and, in my opinion, pretty damn cool. The surface of a disc, and we'll start simple and work with a floppy disc here, is, as I stated, um, iron oxide bonded to a mylar core. And when you zoom in, the iron oxide kind of looks like this. Uh, well, you know, kind of use your imagination. So there's lots of tiny little wee grains of iron oxide which are a few nanometers across. And when you pass a magnetic field over it, or in our case a fluctuating magnetic field, it actually becomes magnetized in domains, which is areas of surrounding particles which are magnetized in the same polarity, north or south. So, and it actually does look like this under a magnet. You'll have a section here that's north, and then you'll have a bit that's south, and then you'll have a bit that's north, and then this bit will be north, and then that bit will be south, and that bit will be north, and so on like that. Now each of these bands is called a magnetic domain. So as a right head moves across here, it will write or polarize the iron oxide molecules into these domains to mark our ones and zeros. But that's not actually technically correct. Now if we jump over here, we're going to call this a sector, a very short sector of polarity. So we're going to assume as we come into our sector that we are on a north bit, or at least, sorry, a um, northern polarity as we're reading into our sector. And the polarity goes like this, north, north, south, north, south, south. Now, it's important to note that, unlike what you might assume, which would be, say, a north is a zero bit and a south is a one bit, or vice versa, the way that the drive controller actually interprets one bits is on a polarity transition, or a flux transition. So going north to south, or south to north, is a one bit. However, north to north, or south to south, is a zero. So kind of like this. So if we come in with a north, we haven't got a transition, we haven't got a transition, now we're going north to south, south to north, north to south, and then again no transition, south to south. And so this would be read as a 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. And this is important, and we'll get to it a little later when we talk about GCR. That. And this is where things get kind of cool. To be able to tell between one area of a disc and another, they have to organize the disc. And so, this is where tracks come in. Imagine, if you will, that this is our floppy disk. And the diskette is organized into concentric circles, or tracks. So, for example, and I'm simplifying this, but work with me here. This could be track 0, track 1, track 2, track 3, and so on, into the center. In a hard disk, you may have heard the term cylinders, heads, and sectors. In a floppy disk, we have tracks. On a hard disk, we have cylinders. And it's called a cylinder because, if you imagine, it's a track on a single platter, but when you have one platter, and then the underside, the top of this platter, and that one, it is the same track going downwards, so they are a cylinder, if you can imagine this as a three-dimensional object. So, we have tracks, or cylinders, and we have sectors, and they divide the circumference of the disk into a sector. Now this is where hard and soft sectors come in. We're going to jump from here for just a second to hard disk technology. Sort of. You'll notice that the inner sector here is shorter in physical length than the outer sector. And the way that this is compensated depends on the technology and the drive. For example, a Commodore 1541 disk it actually has a different number of sectors as the disk goes out. PCs aren't quite that smart. 
So because the data that's pulled off the disk is clocked, as the data comes off, it's not synchronized. Um, it clocks from the data self-clocking source. If the data is more stretched out, as in a longer sector, it doesn't actually matter. But it still has the same amount of data. So where, for example, this might be a 512-byte sector, this is also a 512-byte 500, sector. It's just physically longer, and that wastes space. So the hard disk people, they came up with something called ZDR, Zone Density Recording. And this is a bit more of what a 1541 looks like, kind of. And they break the sectors into, or rather, they break the disk into even length sectors. And they are not organized quite as nicely, but this way um, you're not wasting space. You don't have a sector out here that's twice as long as it needs to be for the same amount of data. Now while talking about hard disks and cylinder heads and sectors, uh, those who used older machines with older BIOSes, the IDA disk setup tended to ask cylinder heads and sectors to identify the disk. Now this calculation allowed it to determine exactly how the disk was laid out. So first you have cylinders, and that is the number of concentric tracks, as we discussed, and then heads. And that tells us how many read and writable services there are. Now in this case, this happens to have two platters, and we're going to assume it used all four heads. One, two, three, four. And then finally, sectors. How many individual sectors the cylinders were broken up to. Now if we assume a 512 byte per sector size, which was relatively standard, say we take, and I stole this from Wikipedia, an example of 500 cylinders, so 500 tracks, four heads, like this, and then 32 sectors per cylinder. So if we take 512 bytes, times it by 500 cylinders, four heads, 32 sectors, we come up with 32,768, I'm sorry, 32,768,000, which is 32 unformatted megs. And now you know. Now while we're talking about disks, let's talk about hard and soft sector. Original disks were hard sectored. They used a physical indexing hole to tell the disk drive controller where the sectors began and ended. Later disks like this one are soft sectored. There is a single index hole which identifies the zeroth or first track, depending on the controller and the manufacturer. And then um, the sectors are delineated by a specific bit string on the disk yet. We'll look at that in a second, actually. But I have a hard sector disk in the uh, drive here. Okay, I got the flashlight in my mouth. Work with me here. You can see the index hole here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the spindle. Can you see, there we go, all of the individual indexing holes. And this is actually quite hard to do with my hand on the back of this thing. Now there's still a sector 0 or sector 1 index, and that is identified. Here we can see it. there are three holes in quick succession. The largest hole is the sector 1. Now talking about soft sectors and how they're identified by the disk controller, if we take a Commodore 1541 and imagine that this is a sector. The sector begins with a synchronization, uh, and it happens to be an FF or a 255 in uh, decimal or what have you, uh, and the amount of bytes in the synchronization header depends on the track that it's on. Remember, the inner tracks are physically shorter sectors than the outer track. So uh, on an inner track, there'd be less bytes than on an outer track. The header itself includes a header block ID, a checksum of the block ID, sector number, track number, and then a disk ID and some padding. And the disk ID is used, and this is also why they have disk labels on MS-DOS disks and things like that, so that if you ejected the disk, the controller knew that the disk had changed because it doesn't always keep the drive spinning. 
and the controller could then pass on across the floppy bus to the computer that the disk gate had changed and that the data that you thought was there, such as the uh, directory listing, had changed. Uh, then there is a fixed synchronization um, sector, which, I'm oh, sorry, a synchronization mark, which is five FFs. And then there's the data block itself. There's a data block ID, the data, a checksum, and then some padding to fill out the, I think it's 256 bytes on a 1541 sector. So as the drive is reading data off the diskette, it will locate the first sector, and then it counts sectors from there. Now in the 1541, there's actually a sector ID number. In PC disks, there is not, and it simply counts the number of synchronization markers that it finds as it goes around to determine what sector it's on. Cool, huh? Now we get to the most complicated part. Kind of, sort of. Now remember I mentioned that the disk was, or the bits were read on the flux transitions of the disk gate of the magnetic media. Now this leads to a problem, because if you have too many bits in a row that are a zero bit, the floppy disk controller can actually lose synchronization. It no longer has the ability to correctly clock the data off the disk. And so some rather clever people invented a way of encoding data so that there were never more than two zero bits in a row. And this is called group code recording or GCR. There are a number of different recording or encoding mechanisms. There's GCR, which is one of the oldest. There's RLL, Run Length Limited. There's MFM, and then there's EFM, which is what's used mostly these days. Now, as well as not having more than two zeros in a row, GCR allows you to have every combination of a nibble, or four bits, so that you can, without too much loss, encode everything from a 0 to an FF. So a single 8-bit byte is broken up into two nibbles, or two chunks of 4-bit, and it is then using a lookup table encoded as a GCR nibble, which is 5 bits. The disk controller, as it's clocking data off the disk yet, when it sees 10 bits in a row, it knows it has a complete byte, so it will do a reverse encoding or decoding from GCR to a byte that the computer can use and then sticks the disk buffer. When an entire sector is loaded into the disk buffer, the disk will then send it across to the disk controller in the computer. Well, that about covers that, really. We have gone over the history, we've gone over what I've got, which isn't a whole heap, and then we've gone over how this stuff works, which is kind of magic. When you think about it, layer upon layer upon layer, you have the actual magnetic encodings on the disk. You have the encoding of the bits so that it can be read off correctly. You have sectors. You have the disk controller itself interpreting all of this crap. You have the communication protocol with the computer. You have the operating system. You have the, well, not to mention the disk controller in the computer itself, for computers that still have them. And then you have the file system. And then you have the way the operating system works with the file system, the human level abstraction of all of these things working back. Frankly, sometimes it's hard to believe that this stuff actually works, doesn't it? Alrighty then, well that's about that. As always, I appreciate you guys watching, I appreciate all of your comments, and I hope you guys have a fantastic day. Adios.